in ever-expanding regions of this country, there is a real and present threat to your health and the health of your children. A tiny predator, smaller than a freckle, lies in wait, ready to wreak havoc on you and your family. And more often than not, that threat is lurking in places you least suspect and enjoy the most. Thirty years ago, when a handful of children from the little town of Lyme, Connecticut, were first identified with a mysterious form of arthritis, it was not considered an important public health problem. But that's changed. Lyme disease is more than arthritis, and it's not just in Connecticut. It's a national problem. It can be a serious and debilitating disease, and the number of cases are increasing at alarming rates. And the culprit is the black-legged tick, also known as the deer tick. It enters the body through the bite of an infected tick and then disseminates to many places and can cause many different types of disease. Patients with Lyme disease can develop a variety of symptoms, fever, chills, headache, fatigue, and muscle and joint pain, to name a few. Many of these symptoms can be mild and easily overlooked, but the presence of a large, red, expanding bullseye rash is the number one unmistakable sign and should serve as a clear and loud alarm that immediate medical care is needed. Because we know that early diagnosis, early treatment, prevents uh, those later stage uh, complications that are costly and some kind, sometimes can be debilitating. But that's easier said than done. Not everyone develops this bullseye rash or the symptoms they do develop can be confused with the symptoms of many other illnesses. Come on. I was feeling ill and I was getting flu-like symptoms. I was getting headaches and I couldn't sleep. Within a few days, his symptoms got worse. One of my associates at work told me that one of my eyes was blinking faster than the other one. Then my brother came up again from New York City and said, Frank, it's not that one of your eyes is blinking faster than the other one. It's just that one of your eyes isn't blinking at all. And the whole right side of my face went paralyzed. They called it Bell's palsy. I couldn't even talk without slurring my words. It was as if I had had a stroke. I was in extraordinary, excruciating pain. My brother saw me and he just said, Frank, we're taking you down to the emergency room tonight. We went down to the emergency and, and I, they asked, had you been bit by a tick? And I said, yes, I had previously, uh, about a month earlier, but I hadn't displayed the uh, telltale sign of the bullseye rash. So I had basically dismissed it at the time and they couldn't get a yes or no on the Lyme disease. After 48 long hours, the results were finally in. Frank had Lyme disease, and it had attacked his brain. The treatment was massive doses of antibiotics once they had diagnosed it, and they continued me on that um, as an outpatient for five weeks. So being out of the practice was a tremendous burden on the lawyers who work with me, and it was a tremendous setback for my, my practice personally. I love golf. That's why I want to be extra careful now. Frank Brown is only one of the many thousands of cases of Lyme disease reported each year. But according to public health officials, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Lyme disease is uh, one of the most important emergent diseases in the United States. It's a, a major public health problem that's grossly uh, underreported. Yeah, I think it's important that people actually see the tick. People will say, oh, I check my children for these ticks every day, and then we'll hold up a vial of the tick. People will say, that's not a tick. <laughs> ticks will attach themselves to any part of the body, but they often look for warm, moist areas or places where clothing will come into contact with skin like collars or waistbands. Ticks don't fly, and they don't jump down from trees. They live in low grass and fallen leaves where they wait for their next meal. Ticks are very different from mosquitoes because they're going to be attached to you for several days. They're a long-term parasite, whereas the mosquito is kind of hit and run. And they are perfectly designed to attach themselves to an unsuspecting victim without ever being noticed. Grasp your skin with its tarsal claws, uprights itself, and begins cutting the skin with very sharp cutting blades. It then injects you with an anesthetic to keep you from feeling any pain, an anticoagulant to keep your blood flowing, and an anti-inflammatory so you won't itch or develop a welt. It basically cuts 
um, the small blood vessels that are in your skin. And the blood leaks into the, a pool. And uh, that pool builds up during the two or three days that the tick is attached. And during the first two days, the tick really doesn't take in much blood at all. It's preparing for what some people call the big sip. And in the last day, the last 12 hours of its feeding, it really sucks in most of the blood that it's going to take in. And they could take in up to 50 times their body weight in one blood meal. They, they really blow up like a balloon. Get that tick off as quickly as you can. And that'll dramatically decrease your risk of uh, acquiring infection. Proper tick removal is very important. Use a good pair of tweezers. If you use your fingers, you could accidentally rupture the tick gut and release the spirochetes into the wound. Grasp it as close to the skin as you can, firmly and gently. Just pull the tick out. And the skin has a little more stretch than human skin does. You always want to be sure to wash your hands and clean the wound with an antiseptic when you're done. As for the tick? You want to put it in uh, either in a small vial or container and uh, keep it. These ticks can be examined to see if they're infected. Now I'm going to take the tick out. I'm going to poke a hole in its abdomen. I have these three strong positives. This information can be very important in deciding treatment options. If a person present with a large, red, expanding rash, uh, and they are situated in that area of the country where they're exposed to ticks that we know carry Lyme disease, uh, the physician can make the diagnosis based on what he sees and can treat uh, with a simple course of two to three weeks of oral antibiotics. However, under other circumstances where the rash isn't characteristic, it's a part of the country you don't know Lyme disease exists, then you really need to take steps to confirm it in the laboratory as being, uh, as being Lyme disease. However, diagnostic tests may not always be reliable, especially in the early stages of infection. And not everybody develops the bullseye rash. Many doctors may be hesitant to prescribe antibiotics without some kind of proof. And as a result, many people are left undiagnosed and untreated at a time when the disease is most curable. So some individuals with early disease do not yet have an antibody response that we can detect with the tools that we have now. In Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts, Wolfie Blair's early childhood was marked by what doctors thought were growing pains, when in fact, by age seven, he was suffering from serious complications of late stage Lyme disease. He'd had terrible growing pains for years, and I'd brought him over and over again to our family doctor. And they're just like, oh, it's uh, leg cramps and all that stuff. But he had gotten them in places that weren't typical of the classic Lyme's arthritis symptoms. He was getting them in the growing bones. And the doctor just ruled out uh, arthritis because it wasn't joint pain. I woke up in the morning, and my legs really hurt both of them up to my waist. And he was crawling sort of very methodically into the bathroom. And I looked at him and I said, what are you doing? And he said, I can't walk. I didn't know what was happening and I was just thinking what could be wrong, what could be wrong. Um, and um, we just learned about gravity and science. So I was like, gravitational pull is getting stronger. Margot immediately took her son to the emergency room x-rays revealed that Wolfie's problem was not caused by broken bones or injuries. And I said, what's going on here? And so the next obvious thing was to run a Lyme titer. And when it was run, we found that he had a very, very high count. And the doctor told me that this had been in his system for years. Basically, it was just scary knowing that I wouldn't be able to walk for a while. Wolfie was treated aggressively with antibiotics. After quite an ordeal, Wolfie is once again enjoying the pleasures of childhood. You can get it hiking, you can get it by other types of outdoor activities, but most people actually get Lyme disease in their daily activities right in their backyards. I got it right at my front door. I was trimming a bush, thinking I was perfectly safe, and I was bitten on my neck. And within three days, I had a full-fledged bullseye with the red rash, you know, circles around it. 
Sandra O'Neill loves her garden. Like all the members of her garden club, she knew what this bullseye rash meant. And I went to the doctor. He put me on antibiotics. And I was on for three weeks, thinking that I was perfectly OK. About a year later, things started to happen that were very peculiar. And the first thing I noticed, I, I had a, a, a nerve under my right eye that began to jump. And that jumped for about two and a half weeks. No one could see it, but I could feel it. And then my the side of my face started to feel numb. I'm a very active person. And I played tennis three times a week and ran around and gardened and did all of this. And I couldn't even hardly get out of bed. I would wake up in the morning. I would be back in bed by noon. In the following months, Sandra developed a number of medical problems. I had headache day and night. I took everything I could think of to arrest it. and just wouldn't go away. I had a complete physical. He found nothing wrong with me. I had my ears tested. They found nothing wrong with my ears. Everyone kept telling me I was OK, but I was feeling just terrible. Finally, I went to a neurologist. She and I chatted. She asked me, had I ever been bitten? And I said, yes, I had. But that was a year and a half ago. And she said, well, let's just test your blood. So she tested the blood, and the Lyme titer was so high, it was almost off the chart. After two years of antibiotics and $100,000 of medical expenses, Sandra was finally given a clean bill of health. I, you know, thought I was just fine. But um, after we, st we were off, the antibi off of all antibiotics for a month, and I was thinking I was OK. And uh, one morning, I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't walk. I don't think people realize how severe this disease is. I don't think that they have any idea, those that have not experienced it. And those of us that have realize that it, it's just, it's terrible. And it doesn't go away. Dr. Barbara Johnson is trying to find out why patients like Sandra can take massive and prolonged doses of antibiotics and still not be cured. In principle, a spirochete could avoid antibiotics by taking up residence inside a cell. It means that the bacterium can attach to and actually enter the cell and live inside it, and therefore protect itself from antibiotics that do not penetrate cells well, and of course protect itself from the natural defenses of the body. There are other ways to avoid being killed by an antibiotic. One is to go to an area of the body that antibiotics do not penetrate as well, such as the brain. So if someone has an infection in the brain, higher levels of drugs must be used. And in general, if they are introduced directly into the bloodstream, I don't think there's any part of the body that is off limits. But they seem to have a particular preference for skin, joints, the heart, in the brain. They are quite skilled at finding niches where they prosper. I just can hardly believe this. Like, where did this come from? Where was it 30 years ago? The cluster of cases that really opened up uh, our understanding of what Lyme disease is occurred in Connecticut in the mid-1970s, and it manifests itself as an outbreak of arthritis in children. Doctors had facetiously said, I suppose you think this might be some kind of new disease. <laughs> Polly Murray, as a young mother, challenged the medical community to take a closer look at the baffling and debilitating symptoms that were plaguing so many people in Lyme. Over the years, we started getting odd symptoms, um, rashes, stiff neck, sudden fevers, often in the summer. I was hospitalized for different tests for a fever of unknown origin and these rashes. My husband had been diagnosed with a trauma to the knee. My oldest boy was diagnosed with trauma, they said. And uh, my younger boy was, was diagnosed with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And it just didn't make any sense to me as a mother, and I started gathering information on it. Polly discovered there were many children in Lyme and surrounding towns suffering with arthritis. She compiled a list of these cases and reported them to the Connecticut State Health Department. Public health officials knew that certain diseases, especially cancers, can cluster in neighborhoods or communities, but arthritis is not one of them. 
so they enlisted the support of Yale University physicians to find out what was going on. Uh, it was recognized in the New England area that this was perhaps a new and emerging disease. They knew that it had a seasonal distribution occurring in late spring and early summer in particular. They looked at how the cases were distributed and um, in what communities and what were the environments of these communities and they recognized that these were wooded areas, that these were areas that were habitated by deer, that these were areas in which uh, there were uh, deer ticks and uh, some people had anecdotally said that they had removed ticks from the site where the rash illness uh, was later recognized. Then they focused uh, on the possibility of an infectious disease transmitted by ticks. They started collecting these ticks, uh, started examining these ticks. And in the beginning they thought it might be a viral illness rather than a bacterial illness. But it took several years actually and some serendipity before someone recognized that there were these spirochetal spiral bacteria in the tick. This was an important breakthrough. The medical community now realized Lyme disease was not arthritis, but a bacterial infection that should be treated with antibiotics. But many questions remained. How were these ticks becoming infected? Had something changed in the delicate balance of these wooded areas? Scientists trapped dozens of animals and birds searching for the natural source of this new disease. Finally, they identified one of the most plentiful woodland animals as the culprit. Not deer, but the white-footed mouse. In the summer months, larval deer ticks find their way into the world in the moist, dark leaf litter of the forest floor. Searching for food, these tiny ticks seek nourishment from a variety of small mammals and birds. But if that food source turns out to be the white-footed mouse, they will get more than a blood meal. They will also become infected with the germ that causes Lyme disease. And after spending a quiet winter hiding in the leaf litter or resting on a blade of grass, they will molt into nymphs the following spring. If that tick, that nymphal tick, should feed on a human and be on that human for a couple of days, it would during that feeding transfer the spirochetes it had acquired from the white-footed mouse that it fed on